worship God. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Blessed are the people God chose for an inheritance. From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all humanity. From the Lord's dwelling place, God watches all who live on earth. No nation is saved by the size of an army. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear God. On those whose soul is in God's unfailing love. In our in God our hearts rejoice, for we trust in the holy name of our Lord. May God's unfailing love rest upon us, for we put our hope in the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, how shall we do your will today? Will it be in acts of praise, in gifts shared? In prayer who will you lead us to serve? Help us to trust you. Help us to listen. Bless this community as we come together in worship. Encourage us. Comfort us. Unite us. Make our joy complete. Bless us that we may be a blessing. A blessing to you, to our community, to our nation, and to our world. We ask it in the name of Christ our Lord.
trusting in God's goodness, God's grace, and God's mercy, let us once again come before God and confess those things which separate us from God and from one another. Let us pray. Merciful God, in your gracious presence, we confess our sin and the sin of this world. Although Christ is among us as our peace, we are a people divided against ourselves as we cling to the values of a broken world. The profit and pleasures we pursue lay waste to the land and pollute the seas. The fears and jealousies that we harbor set neighbor against neighbor and nation against nation. We abuse your good gifts of imagination and freedom, of intellect and reason, and have turned them into arms of oppression. Lord, have mercy upon us. Heal and forgive us. Set us free to serve you in the world as your agents of reconciling love. share in the juice which you 
may receive by removing the, the uh, cover on that as well. Someone asked me this morning if, if I would share the 4th of July, I don't even know what it is, greeting, I don't know, that I shared with you a number of years ago. It always amazes me what people will remember, the things I say that people will remember. Well, here it goes, a little advice for today. He or she who goes forth, he or she who goes forth on the fourth with a fifth is not likely to come forward on the fifth. Oh, I screwed that up. <laughs> Try again. He or she who goes forth with a fifth on the fourth is not likely to come forth on the fifth. <laughs>
New Testament lesson this morning will be read from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. <clears throat> Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord. that are spoken and heard and in our lives enacted be faithful and true and formed by your grace, O God. For it is in the Savior's name that we pray. Amen. A while back I was reading a, a rather interesting article that compared the uh, leadership styles of Sir Winston Churchill and President Abraham Lincoln. Both Churchill and Lincoln were elected to lead their nations in the midst of unprecedented danger. Great Britain in the 1940s and the uh, United States in the 1860s were both rather discouraged, vulnerable, and unprepared for what was ahead. It is commonly agreed, according to this article, that both leaders saved their nations. And the two men had somewhat similar characteristics. Both Lincoln and Churchill were remarkably accessible. Churchill waded through the rubble of bombed and burned London neighborhoods with his bowler, cane, and cigar. Lincoln walked and rode daily in the streets of Washington and even received just ordinary citizens into his office. Both men served a cause larger than self, a cause that transcended all of the ordinary concerns of prosperity and security. Both men articulated a vision of what the future could be for their fellow citizens. Both men were able to, to communicate their vision to their dreams of what the future could be, and, and they could communicate their call to service and to sacrifice in clear and compelling ways. Churchill's legendary speeches in the House of Commons were not extemporaneous, as many assume. In fact, they were written, memorized, and rehearsed. Lincoln, we know now, took great pains in writing most of his own speeches himself. And he would edit and edit and edit. He would scratch out words and substitute better words, even up to the last minute. And both men were flawed human beings, and each man had their critics. Well, this article concluded by stating that, that part of both Churchill's and Lincoln's greatness, to be sure, 
was the timing of the uh, extraordinary historic situations in which each of them were called to lead. Both men, both men had a dream. Both men had a vision for their countries. And they became a servant of that dream, of that vision. And they became a servant of the people who had chosen them to be their leader. On March 4th, 1865, on the steps of the United States Capitol, Abraham Lincoln delivered his second inaugural address as president. The speech was just 703 words in length, and 505 of them were words of just one syllable. And it took Lincoln between six and seven minutes to give the speech. That's quite a challenge for those of us who stand up weekly and go on for 20 or 25 minutes. <laughs> but it was quite a moment. The war was nearly over. Finally, the Union armies were prevailing and the end was in sight. And in spite of the rain and oceans of mud, Washington was ready to celebrate. But they were also in a very vengeful mood. People in that inauguration crowd that day wore medals and ribbons with words such as no compromise with armed rebels or a foe to traitors. The year before, there had been a massacre of 300 Union troops, most of them African American, at Fort Pillow, Tennessee. Lincoln was besieged with calls for retribution. Northerners were demanding the execution of an equal number of Confederate prisoners. And so the crowd that gathered to hear their victorious president speak expected something triumphant or something with revenge or at the very least satisfaction. But instead, what Abraham Lincoln did in those 700 words was to ask them to think carefully about a vision, about a dream for the nation in the days after the war. Instead of retribution, Lincoln called for compassion based on an inclusive, unifying vision that he had for the nation, South and North. Standing on the steps of the Capitol on March 4th, 1865, Lincoln said, maybe you'll remember them. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have worn the battle, and for his widow, and for his orphan. And in these words, Lincoln challenged all Americans to live up to a greater, larger, and better vision, a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. And of course, 41 days later, Lincoln was assassinated. One professor concludes that his second inaugural speech was actually Lincoln's last will and testament to America, and that Lincoln's words stride across the centuries with the capacity to both convict and heal. Lincoln was calling the nation, as he was called, to be a servant leader. The late Robert Greenleaf came up with this intriguing and important notion that great leaders are, first of all, before anything else, great leaders are great servants. The servant leader, Greenleaf taught, is a servant first. It begins with the natural feeling that one wants to serve, that one is called to serve. It's to make sure that other people's greatest needs are being served. That other people's needs 
are our first priority. That's a rather curious definition of what leadership is and means. It fits Lincoln for sure. And I think in an amazingly consistent way, it reflects the ethical challenge we heard in our second reading this morning. Centuries before Lincoln, a man by the name of Paul wrote to the early Christians in the city of Philippi. If there is any encouragement in Christ, let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Do nothing from selfish ambition. Regard others as better than yourselves. Look not to your own interests, Paul wrote, but to the interests of others. And then Paul goes on to describe Jesus in terms of being a servant leader, emptying himself and living out his obedience to God, even to death on the cross, the perfect servant leader. Paul's compelling vision is of a people, of a church that's united in its faith to Christ, a church, a people that lives in the world with the same mind as Jesus. We as Christians are called to live individually and together as the church, as Jesus lived in this world, as humble servants, as servant leaders. James Tuohy served as the director of the White House Office of Faith-Based Faith -based Initiatives during the George W. Bush administration. As a lifelong Catholic, Jim Tuohy would attend Mass every day at 6.30 a.m. He kept a Bible on his desk. He was trained as a lawyer, and he worked for Senator Mark Hatfield. But during his time during the administration, Tuohy found himself visiting Mother Teresa one day in Calcutta, India. And that experience changed his life. He was immediately handed a basin of warm water, a washcloth, and a gentle order from Mother Teresa to bathe a dying man. A dying man who was but a grotesque skeleton and was covered with open sores and scabs. Now, Tui writes that he was too proud to admit that he was afraid to touch this wretched creature. He meekly obeyed, and he ended up serving there for two years. As a Catholic, he writes, he had always been taught to experience Christ through the sacraments. But to meet Christ in the disturbing disguise of the poor and to be drawn into a personal relationship with Jesus through service to the least of these, this, he writes, was both a revelation and conversion. And that experience, that experience of being a humble servant, refocused his life's work. Let each of you look not to just your own interests, but to the interests of others, having the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. Do you remember the film Gandhi from a couple of years ago? There's a scene in it where Gandhi meets his fellow workers for Indian independence. They get together to talk about tactics, but Gandhi, who's both a political and spiritual leader, he goes deeper than tactics. He goes right to the heart of the matter. Gandhi speaks to them of what he calls the secret of service or the religion of service. And Gandhi just doesn't talk about it. He just doesn't speak. But like Jesus, he acts. Like Jesus, when he washes the feet of his friends, Gandhi acts out a parable of service by stopping a domestic who's, who's there serving tea. And Gandhi takes his tray from him. 
and Gandhi insists on serving his friends himself. And of course, this takes his colleagues back. They're horrified at the reversal of the rules. They are horrified at the thought of their leader acting as a servant. But isn't that what we're called to be? You know, servant leadership is based on a vision, on a dream of what a nation could be. Abraham Lincoln gave the nation a dream of what its precious union could be, and he served that vision, the government, and he served the people. The people he believed were the last best hope for the world. In the end, it could be said that Lincoln literally poured his life out, emptied himself in serving that vision, like Paul said Jesus did. Could it be that the bold challenge, the great adventure of being a Christian today is to live out that dream, to work to make that dream a reality, to be servant leaders in whatever way we can, great or small. To lead on the job, at the office, in the boardroom, in our homes, in our families, in our friendships, in our neighborhoods. To live out that mandate. To be a servant leader. To do nothing from selfish ambition. To look not just to our own interests to the interests of others. To have the same mind of Christ. It just close with this. Ernest Campbell, what served as the senior minister of the famous Riverside Church in New York City, as well as professor of preaching at the Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary in uh, Evanston, Illinois. Dr. Campbell used to remind his students that while their sermons may be directed to the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court or the Secretary of State or even the President of the United States, those people would not often be in the congregations they served. Remember who's out there, Campbell would say. Your sermons aren't going to affect national policy. But we do have convictions as Christians and we have a voice and there are ways to be heard. And we have something else. We have a community that tries to live in the world, in the nation, and in the city with the mind of Christ. And so Campbell writes, until the government comes up with a common vision for our life as a people, the church has one, for sure. And something more. We have, as Christians and as the church, a personal vision of faithful living modeled on the mind and the actions of Christ. The church has a vision and commitment to peace and justice and health and reconciliation and education for children and service as our marching orders based on our servant leader, Jesus. That's a powerful dream. Powerful enough to affect change in our lives and in the, uh, in the institutions that we serve. That's a vision we should all have. Where there is no vision, the people perish, the book of Proverbs says. That's true for nations, churches, and individuals. What's that vision? What's that dream? Paul said it. Have the same mind in you that was in Christ Jesus. Jesus said it too. The one who gives away life for my sake will find it. So therefore, on this 4th of July, let us strive to finish the work that we are in. 
to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for the one who shall be born the battle, and for the widow and the orphan, to do all we can, which may achieve a and she achieved a just, a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. In the name of the one who came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life to set others free, even Jesus the Christ.
Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to you and eat with you and you with me. This is the table of the Lord. We are gathered here to his supper, a foretaste of things eternal. So come, come if you are fearful to be made new in love. Come if you are doubtful to be made strong in faith. Come if you are regretful and be made whole. Come, old and young, there is room for all. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. God of all power, ruler of the universe, you are worthy of glory and praise. At your command, all things came to be. The vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the planets and their courses, and this fragile earth, our island home. By your will, they were created and have their being. From the primal elements, you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the rulers of creation. But we turned against you and betrayed your trust and we turned against one another. Again and again, you called us to return. Through prophets and sages, you revealed your righteous law. And in the fullness of time, you sent your only son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. By his blood, he reconciled us, and by his wounds, we are healed. And therefore, we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all those in every generation who have looked to you in hope to proclaim with them your glory in their unending end. Praise of your name. 
Accept these prayers and praises, Lord. Through Jesus the Christ, the one who came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life to set others free. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night before he died, Jesus gathered with his disciples for one final miracle together. And while they were eating, Jesus took bread, he gave thanks to God, and he blessed and he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, Take and eat all of it. For this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then when the supper was over, he took the cup. Again, he blessed it and gave thanks to God. And he gave it to them, saying, Take and drink all of it. For this cup is the cup of salvation, which is poured out for the forgiveness of your sins in my name. As often as you drink from this cup, remember me. <clears throat> so from that night to this very moment, every time we come to the Lord's table, we remember and we proclaim his saving death until he comes again. This bread and this cup, these are the elements of God's amazing grace for all of us. No matter who we are, no matter where we have come, no matter what the story of our life may have been, these are the gifts of God for you. Come for all things. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the bread of life is broken for you. <coughs> sisters and brothers in Christ, the cup of salvation poured out.
we may show forth your praise among the nations of the earth. In the time of prosperity, fill our hearts with thankfulness. And in the day of trouble, may our trust in you not fail. All of which we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. those 